so we're going to get started with this panel. Uh, our last panelist will come up in just one second. Um, so first, let me just uh, quickly introduce myself as the moderator. So my name is Meredith Karazin. I've spent the last about 12 years working in education. Um, and the last five of those years has been in China, mainly working at an educational nonprofit called uh, Teach for China, which is similar to Teach for America, if you're more familiar with uh, America than China. Um, and the last uh, about year and a half, I've been, uh, I co-founded and have been leading an internal uh, education tech incubator at Teach for China. Um, so I'm really happy to be moderating this uh, panel on education tech trends and entrepreneurship in China. Um, I think it's a very important uh, topic. Um, one of the reasons I think it's so important is just that China, of course, is a massive market. I think when anybody thinks of you know, big markets in the world, uh, one of the first things that you think about is China. And uh, that is very true for education as well as for other sectors. Um, so the kind of annual expenditure of education in China is about 500 billion US dollars. Um, so very huge market. Um, and about 400 billion of that is uh, spent by the public system. 100 billion of that is kind of after school um, outside of the public system. So that's one, uh, I think, reason why so many people have interest in what is happening in China in education. Um, the second thing that I would just note as kind of a framing for this conversation is that uh, the education market is changing very rapidly. So um, traditionally speaking, the Chinese education market has been offline. Um, and it's still, I think, predominantly an offline market. Um, but since this conference is about education technology, um, you know, we're going to talk mainly about uh, online learning. And this is a really fast growing market. Um, so just for a statistic, for those who like statistics, um, in 2012, the amount of ed tech funding uh, that was invested in China was around maybe like 100 million US dollars. Uh, and just this past year of 2015, it was between one and two billion US dollars, depending on who, what sort of statistics you're looking at. So the kind of growth in the education tech market has been um, really, really rapid. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if China is the largest ed tech market either by the end of this year or, or very, very soon. So these are just kind of two uh, things that I wanted to frame the conversation with. Uh, but there's, a, of course, a lot more details to this and a lot more trends that we're going to go into with this panel. Um, so I'm going to quickly just introduce the panelists because I want to spend more time on the questions and their commentary than uh, introductions. Um, so we have a really fantastic panel here. I, I can't think of a more, a better panel to talk about ed tech trends in China, a more diverse panel. Um, so we have Xiaodun, or Dun, uh, immediately to the right of me. Uh, he's a co-founder of a company called Ichi Zoya, or Homework Together. And uh, this is a uh, online homework platform um, for uh, schools and students in China. Um, it has a coverage of about 20 million uh, students. and. It's very notable uh, for its uh, being in the school system. That's, that's kind of rare in China, so he'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, next to him is uh, Cindy uh, Miwenzhen, um, who is the founder and CEO of VIP Kid. And VIP Kid connects uh, North American teachers to uh, students in China for online um, curriculum taught in English. Um, and they've been growing very rapidly over the past two years, so she'll talk about that. Uh, next to her is uh, Bill Ning. Uh, Bill is the, one of the co-founders and partners of uh, FutureWorks, which is a, um, one of the first ed tech venture funds focused on the early stages in China. And then next to him is uh, Julius Lo, the CFO of TAL Education. TAL Education is one of the biggest uh, education companies in China. It's uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and apart from having their own um, education services, they also do a lot of investments in education tech companies, both domestically and internationally. Um, so today we'll talk about um, some major trends in uh, education tech in China. So the first major trend that I want to talk about is, as I mentioned, this move from offline education to online education. Um, so a lot of the market is still traditionally offline, uh, but there is this big move towards online learning. So I want to start actually with Julius. Uh, since you are from a more traditional education company historically, have a lot of you know, offline centers. 
you know, what do you see? Yeah, yeah. How, how is it moving to, how are you guys uh, dealing with this environment of moving to online learning? Are you guys investing in that? Mm -hmm. And how yeah. do you see this trend happening? Yeah, we you ask the questions, someone's laughing in the, in the, in the back. <laughs> because the, 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 your uh, first question may be not accurate. Uh, I, I think uh, coming to today, we have more than 20% of my enrollments coming from online. And the online part, we're fast growing more than 100% every year. Today, more than 80% of my revenue is still coming from offline because we have more than 300 learning centers all, all over the country. So when we come into stage, we think, uh, I personally disagree with the kind of classification of online and offline. I think for us as educators, what we care is what the students can receive and what kind of outcome, what kind of quality training they can receive from us, no matter it's online or offline. That's a different way. With the advancement of a new technology, we are seeing more and more students, they get used to use the new, new, new technology, including tablets, PCs, something else, to use different way to, to, to do the learning. But it doesn't mean there is a very, very uh, important uh, uh, difference between online and offline. So the reason for us, why we spend a lot of time in online, uh, and, uh, I think the, that, that, that's, quite, that's very simple. It's because in the beginning, the company was founded. Actually, we are starting from Osho.com, which is the first wave of the um, online uh, community uh, in China. And right after that, we figured out mm, the physical learning center is the most profitable way for us to make money and survive. Then we do a lot of offline. But coming to today is we are seeing the trainings happening. More and more um, people, they change their behavior. And we're also seeing is in China, it's a huge market. We have around more than 2,000 cities. But even I, try, I do the best. We are maybe one of the largest companies in K-12 area in China. But even I do the best. I, I double my size. I triple my size. I can, own, I can still do the business in around top 40 or 45 cities. That's it. But how about the rest of over 1,000 cities? So we have to look for some way to do that. Online is our definitely some kind of choices we have made. And it's not purely online. We should have a lot of blending models. Maybe 20% offline, 80% online, half online, half offline, blah, blah, blah. That depending on the uh, 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 real situation and the needs from the, uh, from the consumers. So that probably that is something we still need to do more and more. Great. Um, and so I want to ask Cindy. So Cindy, you used to, you used to have an offline English education mm. business, yep. um, and now your new company, VIP Kid, is just an online business. So I'm wondering why did you feel inspired to start an online education company? Right. So um, I started my first business uh, back in 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, it's about 16 years ago. It's a brick and mortar training center with 20,000 students nowadays in 23 centers in six cities in China. But the reason I want to move to online is pretty simple. One statistics to share with you guys is that uh, it is a 16 billion US dollar market in China that parents spend on after school tutoring, language learning every year. This is how big the market is. And my previous company caught only 30 million US dollar of that. And we're already top 10 in China. And speaking of online, it is a very small penetration nowadays. It's only less than 1%. VIP Kid started two years ago. Now, nowadays, we're already the largest and the best you know, online company for uh, children's learning is simply because we're creating 60 uh, you know, million sales revenue in US dollar this year. And uh, the total market, maybe, I guess, is 100 million. Um, and it's growing. It's growing exponentially because it we're only 1% of the total market share. So, um, well, what is the market nowadays in China? It's pretty fragmented in the area of uh, language learning and teaching. It's, um, there are 30, 000, 35,000 uh, children's English training centers in China. But there are only like 40,000 certified uh, ESL teachers. So um, my previous business, one pain point that I feel personally as a teacher, teacher who taught, you know, start teaching in 1998 for seven years in the classrooms and then developed of that company, of course, is that we're so lack of qualified teachers from all over the world. And then we are 
we have such few access to your great content for our students. Brick and mortar setting is 70, like uh, the curriculum was developed in 1970s, it's so old for our children. So I want the best for the kid as a teacher, as an educator. So that's why I founded VIP Kid uh, two years ago. So um, two reasons. One is business, I talk about it. And the second thing I think is very personal. Um, I uh, you know, didn't go to college. I quit uh, at uh, high school when I was 17. And I taught everything to myself. You know, all the English language, the, um, the business, and the GMAT. You know, I went to business school 2010 only when I was 27 years old. I, you know, I think every child is a VIP. That's why we call it VIP kid. And they deserve the best. They're so curious that if they are enabled and empowered with the knowledge uh, from the, the globe, they should be able to learn. I was so inspired by mm -hmm. um, Condola's uh, rice yesterday when she spoke. I actually cried. She said, you know, regardless of the class, education is the way going to the future. It doesn't matter where you came from. So all the kids from China are going global. Thank you. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> Um, so I want to ask, uh, Dun, I mean, I think that one of the big differences between the Chinese education system and the U.S. education system in terms of the public system is that uh, there's really not that much usage of technology yet in the Chinese public education system. And even though people talk about how hard it is to sell to schools in the U.S., let me tell you, I think you should try to go to China and then you'll see how hard it really is. And then you can come back and feel like it's much easier in the U.S. to sell the schools. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I would love to hear your reflection. I mean, I think that your company, Homework Together, is one of the few companies that has had success in really scaling to schools. So what has been your secret? How have you brought this online business to schools? Yeah, I'd like to share a quick observation. So as you can notice, my uh, fellow panelists have uh, offline notes, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so they're more used to offline learning, I guess. <laughs> much more experience than me. <laughs> my notes are uh, on the cloud. <laughs> I'm connected wirelessly to my notes. Uh, uh, but seriously, um, it's very, very challenging to promote to uh, Chinese schools. 99% uh, of the K-12 schools are uh, state-owned schools, uh, which means their stakeholder is the government, 100% owned by the government. And it's very heavily regulated, uh, both in terms of the management and the content and the uh, so-called ideology uh, that is taught. Uh, but we have this very simple belief uh, that ed uh, technology is going to change the way we learn. And for young students, because they spend 90% of their time in schools, at least uh, given the current situation, uh, we see no other way to transform this way of learning uh, than going to schools. Um, uh, and and uh, we have found that if you make any product in K-12, uh, whether it's in China or you know, outside China, we have this simple saying, without teachers, there's no retention. Without parents, there's no monetization. Um, so you, you need to create a, a very strong network of teachers, uh, students, and parents. And uh, we found this uh, natural product called Homework, uh, which in China had a, a daily active user of 200 million students, <laughs> uh, a 12-year uh, retention of something like 100%. <laughs> and, uh, 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 lots of learning data accumulated and a very strong network uh, based on real names in classrooms uh, which involve teachers, students, and parents. And this product was very weak. Um, um, it was uh, very, very inefficient. It was very boring. Um, and uh, we've been used to this product for the last uh, 60 years or so. Uh, so we think we can definitely um, improve the product a little bit um, by using technology. And that's kind of what we've been doing. And uh, even we think our product, which is kind of a hybrid form, it's not a purely online homework, it's a, a so-called O2O home homework, um, uh, kind of closed loops of uh, O2O cycles uh, for teachers to interact with students um, through the homework process. Um, is, and we think is the product is much stronger than the uh, uh, traditional offline homework. Uh, it's still very challenging to promote schools. So we have uh, many uh, offline staff, many marketing people who go to talk to schools and uh, principals and, and teachers and uh, school districts. And uh, we um, basically educate them on this philosophy that if you uh, embrace technology, then um, you're going to give better outcomes to your students. And uh, th there's really no secret there. It's a lot of hard work. Uh, but I, I guess the uh, if there is uh, something is that we really believe that uh, it's, it's something that's worthwhile to do. And, um, and we've been doing it uh, step by step for the last uh, four and a half years. 
Great, thank you. Um, so I want to ask last uh, you, Bill, since you're investing in early stage education tech companies in China, what do you see as some new promising models of online learning that are coming up? Uh, that's a hard question. <laughs> uh, if, if I knew every uh, new business model in education, and I would invest in, invest in them secretly, and I will not tell you all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's, uh, it, I'm very happy today because yesterday when I uh, listened to Rice uh, presentation, and uh, uh, the CEO of Tu Yu uh, said to me, uh, just as he, he was sitting right next to me, uh, he said, there are so many Chinese here. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm happy to hear that. And today is a panel about Chinese entrepreneurship in EdTech. And I still so see so many Chinese faces here. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, I think it's a lucky lucky area for EdTech, especially for EdTech in China. Uh, I'm from FutureWorks, one of the first EdTech accelerator in China. Uh, we laid a heavy bet on online education uh, in Chinese education market. And by far, we have invested in over uh, 30 ad tech startups. And uh, uh, we are more like uh, Y Combinator in education in China. Uh, we, we invest a small portion of money in each ad, ad tech company. And uh, we stay closely with them in a three month period, which is called acceleration. And after the acceleration, we give a demo to link them with the top tier uh, VCs in China. This model is uh, uh, very similar to Y Combinator, which is the first stop that I came here to San Francisco to visit. And uh, uh, we have invested intens intensively in online education. Uh, by referring to online education, which is not only means the online B2C training like uh, Cindy, Cindy does in China, it's not only like the uh, apps and tools for uh, homework like uh, Sheldon does, and it's also not uh, li uh, like the O2O, -O, the blended learning like uh, uh, FutureWork does. We have a new definition to online education, like the new kind of uh, social networks for teachers. Uh, we have invested a, a, net a social network for kindergarten teachers, which uh, has covered about one-tenth of Chinese uh, kindergarten teachers and also online B2C training. We have invested in the online uh, drawing school. I mean, you mean you have, can you imagine that? A kid aged three to eight can learn drawing uh, purely online uh, to communicate with teachers. It's, it's, it's also like a similar to a reversed class. Uh, and we also in, invest in smart hardwares. Uh, we have we, one of our star portfolio is uh, uh, wristband for piano learn learners. Originally, when we invested in them, it's valued only about two million U.S. dollars, but it has recently closed its latest A round. It, it's valued about fifty uh, million U.S. dollars, and I think it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a fantacular uh, a case. And also, we invest in some uh, traditionally not so online mode, like we invested. Uh, Kid Disney in China. Uh, I just uh, use the word Disney. It's a, it's a it's a children's children's playing playing ground. But you know, in China, there are more than fifty cities with a population over two million, and I think each of them needs a a miniature of Disney. And so we invested, and also we invested some uh, kind of a, a kid food company, uh, which produce kid food for. Uh, or infant food for 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 infants aged uh, zero zero to three for the new for the uh, uh, urban mothers uh, who are very busy and uh, uh, who do not have enough time to prepare food for their children. So in total, I think uh, when we when we constantly refer to the words online education, uh, I will not use that definition uh, as a narrow one. I think every uh, education product which use technology to improve the uh, uh, efficiency of classroom classroom learning and uh, uh, home learning and uh, uh, mobile learning is online education. 
So I, we are the most op optimistic about Chinese online education, and we lay a ha heavy bet by invest uh, real money in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time I come to that I came to the United States, and I want to look for partnerships with the uh, overseas. Uh, partners, both uh, in the capital side and in the entrepreneur side, and uh, hopefully, I I I I, may, I I I see these opportunities, and I see the I see all our effort work. Thank you very much. Great. So I think uh, I just want to kind of close out this particular trend by just asking kind of a more provocative question because I think. Bill, you're so enthusiastic about online education. I think mm -hmm. much of this panel is. And I'm just wondering, are there certain aspects, maybe just one person could comment on, do you think there are certain aspects of education that won't move to online? Or will take a very, very long time to move to online? Because I think one thing is, you know, technology is actually so um, ubiquitous in China. If you're, especially in the, in the big cities, you know, everybody's on their phone and it's really taken over commerce. Uh, E-commerce is like, I don't even go to the grocery store anymore. <laughs> I get all my groceries <clears throat> to come to my house. Um, but what do you think? Do you think that will happen in education, or do you think there's aspects that will never go to oh. online? Uh, thank you, Meredith. You, you, that's, that's really a provocative question. Because if, you, if I answer it incorrectly, and I, I'm recorded, <laughs> and maybe, maybe someday you will, you, will, you, will, you will. Anyway. <laughs> but, as for the, but as for the prediction, I think the most important factor is time. Uh, within the 10 years' time, I think every aspect of education will be dramat dramatically changed by technology, which is internet at this time, and, and maybe mobile internet in, at this time, but maybe visual reality uh, in the next uh, 5 to 10 years. I think with a technology, uh, every aspect of education will be uh, changed because uh, uh, technology has changed the business model of education uh, with regard to who are the cost, cost, who are the customer, what what are the products, and what is the market strategy, and uh, all in all the financial models. I mean, the business models are changed with the technology. So, so I, do, I do not think, uh, I cannot think of any education that cannot be uh, drastically changed by uh, technology. So uh, I understand that Meredith is referring to some uh, like key education, like uh, all comprehensive or holistic education, which rely heavily on the human, human interactive uh, involved. But I think all these all these all these aspects can be uh, better with education. For for just one quick example, uh, traditionally we do not think that online education can uh, provoke very much interactive in, interactive interactiveness between teachers and the students. But now with WeChat in China, I mean WeChat, it's like a WhatsApp and a Messenger in the United States. The teachers or the tutors can can communicate very, uh, uh, very frequently with the kids. It promotes a very good model for teacher students or even student students uh, communication. So I think uh, every aspect has been dramatic of education has been dramatically changed by education. I think maybe in five or 10 years, you will not argue or ask such question as if a certain area cannot be changed by technology. And that's my Great. answer to this question. We'll see who looks better on video yeah. later on. The <laughs> Me asking the question or your answer. <laughs> yeah, you can comment. Quick, yes, uh, 30 sure. seconds. But we do have an accessibility problem, I guess. 50% of the country is still not online. Yeah. So uh, for more of the rural country areas, then there, there's something we need to do as educator and technology person to help those you know, uh, children have access to internet, I guess. That's also part of our 50, 30s five-year plan in China, 95% of the classrooms connected to online. Okay. Yeah, great. That's a very important point. I think there's a big gap between... No, I just realized uh, East uh, Timor has only 1% of internet penetration. I didn't oh. realize that in wow. East Asia and Pacific countries. Yeah, yeah. wow. Um, okay, great. Very interesting discussion. I want to move on to the second trend that I wanted to talk about, which is 
the move from maybe more rote memorization type of education or high stakes testing education to maybe more holistic education or education um, that is a little bit more international. So I think when a lot of people think about Chinese education system, they typically think of uh, that they are very good at preparing kids to take tests. And that's certainly very true. Um, but I think that one of the big trends that's happening right now in China is that there's uh, a lot of reform of the education um, and there's a lot of desires by parents and by students for a more holistic education um, that's not just geared at test taking. Um, so I wanted to first ask Cindy a little bit about this because you're definitely tapping into this market of, of you know, parents that are looking at for more holistic and international mm -hmm. education for their kids and uh, you know, would love to hear your reflections on that market and the growth of that market. Of course, uh, international education and holistic. When, when we started 2014, we uh, piloted our program with 100 uh, student, 10 teachers. Everyone thought I was crazy, five-year-old, to learn online. Ask these guys after the meeting, they would agree with me. <laughs> um, but many send their kids to the program, you know, they probably thought, oh, let's see how you know, bad this can go, and you know, we'll see. But um, children, five-year-old, very curious, very, they, they're close to tablets when they're two years old, all the apps. Um, FaceTiming their grandparents. A lot of times our kids are deciding whether they're attending our program. We watch our trial classes on audio video streaming technology uh, while this takes place and it's 25 minute session one on one with American teacher and after the class parents usually ask, so how do you feel? Do you like it? Tom. And Tom says, I want to sign up. When is the next class? And mom would pay regardless how expensive she you know thinks it might be so this is the young generation of chinese parents the older generation looks so much upon like task prep examination this is not what happens nowadays in china so show me your hands if you haven't been to china please wow that, not many okay so show me your hands if you were not there for the past three years just a few, very good. All of you know about the market, right? And then talking about international education, we, are, we have half a million children going abroad, sorry, students going abroad and learn uh, after high school every year. Times that by 16, you've got almost 10 million of the population that actually do international education, right? But uh, times three will be the people who are interested. And that's what we get when students are five years old. Parents think, can, we, can I send them to international schools? But the problem is with 20 million population in Beijing city alone. There are only 5,000 seats for international schools. You cannot get in, you're not a pa foreign passport holder, right? And then you also have a huge opportunity cost of losing uh, like Gaokao track in, in China. So um, I guess that's you know, where we come in uh, for uh, VIP kids. I think international education, I want you all to think about this. What is international education? How, what is in your mind for American kids, for example, global education? In my mind, I think it's great curriculum with great connection to the world, regardless of China to US or US to China. And with what we're doing here, we're actually bringing international education to children in China you know, without having to send them abroad at a very early age. We create all these curiosity, you know, creativity. Mm. That's, what, uh, that's what we're encouraging here. So uh, I guess that's why we're pretty popular among the Chinese parents. Um, we have a 50% like, new student coming every month referred by our existing parents. We're very, very proud of that. And also, our teachers, I want to talk about that later, from the US, <coughs> we've got almost 2,000 of them. 90% um, retention on both sides as they renew every half a year or one year. So international education is big in China. I think every parent nowadays, think about it, the parents nowadays are about 1975 to 1985 borns. Those people, like uh, most people in the room, I guess, is brought like brought up the way you you, you you travel the world. You have the you know the global at your feet since you're little, and then uh, you, you want the, the, your child to learn about the world, not just China or not just the U.S. So uh, I think this is where that's really valuable. Great. And I'm curious, Julius and Bill, your perspectives as investors. I think traditionally people who are making investments in education in China mm -hmm. would look at investments more in uh, areas, products that were tied to academics because that was fairly safe that you know that parents would pay for a product that would boost test scores. But maybe parents would not be as willing to pay for a product that doesn't have as much uh, tie into academic performance. Do you see that? changing? Are you making investments that are more in kind of soft skill developments? Yeah. 
uh, Bill is our school head before, so I try to answer. You 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 you, you have more notes over there. Okay. I think um, even we look back backwards, in the past twelve years when TAL become uh, we we start from a very small school in Beijing, and now we have a lot of presence all over China. So, but when you do more interviews with the real teachers uh, and the parents and the students. In the first beginning, they care how much scores, how many scores they can improve right after the classes. But today, if you go inside mm. and ask them, they care more about experience. They are being improving every day. Sometimes scores is not that important. In the past two days, a lot of foreign investors they asked me, or foreign um, friends they asked me, hey, do you have any proof the kids right after the, tu the tutoring in your company, you have uh, their scores or the performance is much better than before? I say, guys, I never showed them in the past five years already because the parents have changed. What they care more is the experience. You, your kids are being taken care of and you're feeling you're improving. So we, we, we even would like to um, emphasize more how we care the students more than how many scores we can improve from there. And we also have the other kind of philosophies. Today, if you run into the TL uh, classrooms, we not only teach them the knowledge. We also teach them how you can make friends, how you can kind of deal with the pressure, how you can network with the other people, how you can make your life much easier. So the, because we're only taking care of the top kids, top 30%, they are self-motivated enough. So what we should do is try to train them, hey, guys, not only the knowledge, you are good enough already. I know you can even better and better, even great, even maybe number one in the world. But again, you're taking care of something else. So I think from parents and the students and, and even our teachers, their behavior and the philosophy has changed gradually. Of course, if you're going to the tier three or tier four cities because they don't have that enough choices, the only way for them to be successful, maybe is they need to have a, a very good score. Over there, yes, they care a lot of how many scores you can improve. But the whole country is a huge mix. Some top tier places, they have fast improving, and the other places, they will uh, uh, catch up quickly. I hear, I still remember what famous person says, we <coughs> always overestimate the changes or the impact of technology in the, com in the, in the coming two years. Mm -hmm. But we always underestimate in 10 years time. Mm -hmm. So. What we can see today is actually, and uh, I quite agree, I, I want to uh, uh, try to re-emphasize the points from Cindy, mm. is the parents today are quite different, and the students today are quite different from, from, from our times. We, are, we were born in the year 1990. We feel we're still young generation, but actually we are not. But if you <laughs> talk to the classmates of my, now my, my, my son's seven years old, so if you talk to him, it's totally changed. So when we talk about internet, uh, kind of globalization or, or international, we have different layers. The first layer is as traditional as, traditional as we can see in the, in the past is how we can send kids to study abroad. Mm -hmm. But that's maybe a small percentage. Every year in China, we're sending around 500,000 students out. And you are from US, you know, you have quota. You have a lot of laws and policy too prevent too many Chinese people come to your school, <laughs> right? So for us, the real internalization or globalization is not sending too many kids to US, but let them to be <coughs> international in China. What some of the ways we can set our campus, maybe uh, just similar to the New York City in Shanghai, they have a Shanghai campus sitting there that's exactly the same New York City. And, uh, the, the other way is saying as VIP kids, and some other way we have VIP ABC, blah, 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 blah. Because we cannot have that many foreign teachers sitting in Beijing, so we have to leverage the, the online technology to, to teach the kids. That's also a very good way. But um, in my eyes, frankly speaking, I'm very reluctant to talk about education with work. It's too big and too strong. We, what we are doing today is tutoring. Tutoring is only complementary to education. It's a small part of that. So what we're thinking about is, with the new change uh, in the parents and kids, with the new change in, in the new technology, with the, a lot of things is happening today, I think what we care more is 
it's not only kind of online or offline or something like that. What we care more is whether we can leverage enough resources and support to help the students, Chinese kids, to be more international. So in this perspective, we can foresee in the coming five, five or ten years' time, the whole industry will change. And we can see more and more international Chinese kids will, will, will show up. They not only come through VIP key, but also come through the other behaviors. Mm -hmm. So that's something we, we should bear in mind. When we talk about, when we think about China education, it's now it's the same as when we think about in the 20 or 10 years ago. Everything is fast changing in China. So in the coming five or 10 years, maybe we're much smaller, uh, we, we, we will be much similar to, to, what, uh, to uh, what they are in Korea or Japan. And after 10, 20 years, maybe we will very similar as what we see in the US. So that's something we need to keep in mind. Yeah, Great, and I think you mentioned one thing that was sort of my provocative question around this, <laughs> which is whether or not uh, holistic education is really yeah. just a high-end market right now. Have you seen anything that, have you seen any promising companies that are working on more holistic or global education yes. that are targeting yes. you know, ma the mass market? Yes, we are seeing that. And more and more companies are showing up in the past two years, like VIP Kid. They have a lot of numbers. Uh, I cannot share, <coughs> but she can. So they are fast growing <laughs> and doing very well. And at the same time, we have VIP ABC, who just really closed their, I forgot which round, E or F or D? Uh, anyway, their market valuation is around $1 billion. And we also have a, a big company called 51 Talk. Yeah. Who is who? Are, who is about to IPO in in, uh, in New York? Maybe I, I don't know when, but they are doing that. So they are also doing quite well over there. And even I myself, <coughs> for a very small example, is I only have a very small team. In the first beginning, only three people. We hire a GM from the other company and come to work for us. And they will launch a program in last year May, uh, which is we call Le Wai Jiao. So you know, right after that, after three months. We have more than 10,000 students studying in an online platform. So i a little bit concerned about the rough high-end market because the students actually coming here, they are now the typically high-end customers. Mm, right. They are kind of, is, I can see it's a very good mix between rich people and kind of common people. Mm. So the needs from there is quite different. Yeah, yes. great. Cindy, and please. Cindy, you wanted yeah, to add one something? Point. I just want to say yeah. that six parents in China spend money for one child. So it's not necessarily a premium market. It exactly. is we're spending anywhere for English language learning, uh, yes. 1,000 to 3,000 US dollars. This is the mass market. But uh, talking about uh, like rural area, poorer like, uh, family kids, where we can help, that's where we can do uh, one versus many classes, group classes, and all, all even like free content. That's something so definitely great. WebPKid is interested in doing in the future. So. Uh, yeah, that's the comment. Great. Yeah, and by six parents, you mean the because oh, of the one child grandparents. policy, grandparents. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Not 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 <laughs> six real, not six parents. Just to clarify on that. Yeah. <laughs> now it's changing. Now it's yeah, changing. a lot is changing <laughs> in China. Changing. Go, go right. and check it out. Yeah. Right. Six parents. Um, Okay, great. So uh, <laughs> the third trend that I wanted to talk about was what I talked about at the very beginning in framing this conversation is the growth of education tech funding. Um, so just yeah. the amount of venture capital that's going into this uh, industry and fueling its growth. Um, so I think uh, I wanted to ask uh, Shaldun about this because uh, he's raised a significant amount of money, uh, $100 million Series D last year. Um, and so want to hear a little bit about, uh, for you, why did investors have such an appetite to invest so much money in your company? Mm, okay, you should ask the investors, I think. <laughs> <laughs> or how did, how did you raise the money? <laughs> um, I can pass the information back to Xiaohong. <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, firstly, we were very fortunate to have uh, investors who really understood the market. Um, our angel investors were Bob Xu and Victor Wang, who are co-founders of New Oriental, which at the moment, it's still the biggest education company in China, I think, right, Julia? Yes. Yes. And yes. <laughs> <laughs> we always agree. <laughs> All right. Even my P is double, but we always agree. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then we had uh, Shunwei, which was uh, uh, founded yes. by a uh, chairman of uh, Xiaomi called Lei Jun. Uh, he invested in many uh, successful internet companies as well. And uh, we were their first education investment, but he gave us lots of insights on uh, how to develop um, 
how to apply the idea of the internet to any uh, traditional industry. Uh, and then we had uh, Xiao Hong from H Capital, who was uh, formerly the uh, China head for Tiger Global, uh, which was, by the way, uh, the investor for both New Oriental and uh, Tao uh, before they went public. And uh, Tomasic, which is a, a Singapore sovereign fund. Um, and we had DST as well. Uh, so I think it's very important uh, to choose uh, the right investors for this, uh, for this industry uh, because it's a kind of a special industry. Especially uh, our model is very, very far away from money. And we have to deal with um, three user groups, teachers, students, and parents. We make different products for them. We make um, products for uh, students of different ages. Uh, mm -hmm. We make different subject homework. Um, we make products for different regions. And uh, we do all of this for free. <laughs> and, uh, and currently, we cover about 20 million students, uh, which is about 10% of the K-12 population in China. It took us four and a half years. And I think it will take us another four and a half years to reach 100%. Um, and uh, all of that is going to be done for free. Um, so uh, it's, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a long game. Um, and um, I think the good thing is that um, um, our model is very, very high bar barrier to entry. Uh, we we um, don't really have competition, I think. Uh, maybe the closest competition is about one-tenth our size. Um, and uh, our network is extremely uh, sticky. Uh, our yearly retention is about 90%. And um, um, we accumulate lots of data on the students. Uh, they do homework uh, for about half an hour on our platform uh, almost every day. Um, and we think all of this is going to be extremely uh, valuable. Um, um, but the, vi the vision is, uh, is huge. Um, uh, we really think that there's a problem in uh, education at the moment. Uh, we think that we are manufacturing uh, talent, and which is not fitting uh, for, for, uh, for employment. Um, so we hire lots of roles in our company, like product managers and CTO, and uh, we struggle to find um, uh, people who possess qualities like leadership and uh, creative problem solving, uh, teamwork, uh, good communication skills, and I think uh, it's our education system that's um, um, missing these uh, factors. Um, and uh, we really think that um, homework is the best way to do formative assessment. It's a very frequent assessment which not only identifies your weakness areas uh, in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, but more importantly, tell us lots of insight on the, <coughs> on the learner. And um, so that's really what we want to do. And um, um, I, I think, in essence, you choose uh, investors who, who, are, who are your partners. And uh, people support you in different ways. Our users support us by using us. And uh, uh, we work with lots of uh, ad tech companies uh, who support us with all kinds of resources and investors support us with their, their wisdom and their money. Um, but essentially, uh, you need to choose, choose people who share your, your vision. Okay. And um, I think that's, that's, that's what we've been doing and uh, we'll continue to do it. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, and so, Bill, I had a question specifically for you because one thing that I find interesting, and feel free to disagree with me, this is supposed to be a lively, I was told to make this panel very lively and hence my provocative <laughs> questions. I'm trying to get somebody to like fight with me or something like that. But, um, you know, one thing that I find really interesting is there's this huge growth of money going into ed tech. Yes. Um, but I hear a lot of people say to me that they're having trouble finding good deals, finding good companies, especially at the early stage. And are you, is that true for you? Are you, I mean, you're really focused on the early stage companies. You've done 30 investments in a very, a relatively short amount of time. Have you found it hard to find good companies? Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I answer directly, you, you may think that I'm, I may be a little bit proud of that. <laughs> uh, you know, you know uh, before, before we started FutureWorks, we were colleagues of Health Education Strategic De Investment Department. And uh, within the three years, we have reviewed uh, 3,000 attack cases in China so, and uh, invested in nearly a, thousand, uh, a hundred of them. And uh, we, within that process, we have built good relationships with CEOs of both listed companies and, uh, uh, fam uh, and famous uh, attack startups. So we have great network in Chinese attack field. 
So when we started FutureWorks, we, were n we, we did not have very much trouble in uh, looking for uh, good cases. Uh, in the first recru recruitment of uh, ad tech startups, we received over four, 400 uh, uh, BPs. And uh, among them, we have, uh, find, uh, we, we have selected uh, only uh, five or six uh, ad tech startups in the first batch. So I think we, we, by far, we do not have very much problems in uh, looking for the best deals in ad tech startups. Uh, the reason is uh, the reason is not. Uh, I I I think that the reason is not we have very good networking and we have a, a solid uh, industry background. I think the reason is that there is no uh, similar accelerators solely uh, working on ad tech. So we 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 do not face any competition. As Peter Thiel said, the best the best business is to dominant in a certain field. So in the early stage ad tech invest, investment, we do not have any competitors. You know, like, uh, like Gen Fund, like uh, Innovation Works, they, they have a great amount of money, and they cannot, they cannot, they cannot get them to invest in uh, small cases like- Someone sitting right there. I see, I, I mean, <laughs> I'm telling her. Uh, so, 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 so they are willing to take uh, our graduates from our incubators. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that, so, so that's the case. That's the one case. On the record. <laughs> yes, that's the case that for us to looking for a deal. And uh, another thing that I would comment is on the, on the fund side, on the, on the capital side. You know, you know in last, last year, uh, Chinese ad, ad tech market has uh, draw attention to 1.6 billion US dollars. For the very first time, it overpasses the US, par U US markets, which means that uh, more money, including very smart money, uh, uh, are laying heavy bet on Chinese ad tech market. And in that's in the, because th that's, 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 uh, that's one way. To, but there's only one early stage ad tech accelerator in China. Uh, you, can see, you can see the strong contrast with the great demand of early ad tech start, startups, entrepreneurs, and the strong, the strong input of capital. Mm -hmm. But there is no uh, uh, accelerator or incubator. Yeah. So we, we just meet the demand. So it's hard for it's it's not hard for us to link the capital and the early stage ad tech startups. And one quick comment f to the former question of whether Chinese ad tech startups are test oriented or holistic uh, uh, education. I have a different opinion. I think the U.S. education is also test based. Uh, maybe maybe you do not agree with me, but what on the first day I landed on San Francisco. Uh, my friend Kinson introduced a case uh, to me. It, it, it's a test of preparation for Asian students or even uh, white students to prepare SAT in the United States. I think in the near future, maybe in five or 10 years, there will be a great trend in the United States for high school students to take high quality SAT preparation trainings from both China. Chinese providers and the United providers. I think, <coughs> I think SAT is a very good test, but Chinese uh, uh, college entry, uh, entrance is still based on test. You may argue that uh, if you are a football star and you, if you are a good piano learner and if you, are, you win a gold medal in national physical competition, you will also be accepted by uh, the United, by the U.S. Uh, prestigious colleges, but I think that's another form of test preparation or, or test-oriented uh, standard. You, if you if you want to be a good football star, you have to buy a lot of equipments and you have to you have very good trainers. If you want to win a national physics competitions, you have to still have trainings in that specific area, and if you want to. Uh, good at, if you want to be good at uh, bi biology, you have to buy a lot of uh, experiment equipment. And also, if you want to be a good singer, and if you want to be a, uh, you have also have your own tutors. You know, you know. Yesterday, I went to uh, University of California, San Diego, the the the, the best local 
uh, universities here, and I, I, I walked around the campus, and I visited each uh, individual schools. And you know, it's, this is a recruiting uh, month. A lot of parents and a lot of students are visiting the colleges. And I saw, uh, I, I saw a television which are, which, which are showing uh, the videos of applicants. And those applicants who are very good at singing and at sports and at leaderships and I, even at peace studies, I think they got trainings. The only problem is that this is in the United States. So the training companies is not as strong as Tel and as Cindy's and as Ichijuoye. And I think as time goes by, when the standard of college entrance are more uh, obvious or, or more, uh, there, are, there, will, there, will, there will be trainings or tutorings everywhere. So, so uh, when, when we are doing our investment, we do not tell the difference between test prep or holistic. I think it's every, everything is about a standard, a standard for, for, for others to tell the difference from different students. So mm. I, I do not think that, think that is a difference for us to invest. We only invest in larger amount of consumers and good, 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 uh, good quality, uh, good quality products and as, as long as it mess these two market pro, pro, product feet, we will invest, no matter you call it test prep or, or holistic education. That's my point. Okay, great. So if you are a Chinese company or Chinese entrepreneur that wants to expand your business to the US around um, you know, preparation in, in a lot of areas, you should find Bill, because it seems like he's very excited about this market. <laughs> um, so I think that actually- one, 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 one more quick comment on Meredith's word. The, the American are willing to pay 200 or 500 US dollars an hour for a SAT preparation course online. Can you imagine that? It's a huge market. <laughs> yeah. okay, so definitely find him. <laughs> I think <it's laughs> um, so I think that brings me to my last kind of trend that I wanted to touch on which is this cross-border collaboration between China and the US. Um, I think we can just see through this conference that um, there's a lot of interest both in uh, Chinese companies that want to partner with US companies or seek US investments. And there's a lot of US companies now that uh, want to go to China or find Chinese investors. Um, so this is a big, this cross-border collaboration is a, a big rising trend. Um, so I first wanted to ask Cindy about this since your business is inherently cross-border. Mm -hmm. right. uh, what do you see as the opportunities for you in having a business that spans between China and the U.S.? Right, so we work with American teachers and then Chinese students. So one thing is we might be the one, one of the largest cloud school, like with a full stack solution. We're charging our students 3,000 U.S. dollar. Important point, we are partners with very many ad tech companies here in the US. A lot of American investors are interested in, in me, but I'm very interested in all the uh, ad tech uh, startups here. We're look at very actively looking for content partnerships. You know, we're very looking, actively looking for um, assessment tool technology partnerships, as well as teacher acquisition partnerships. Yeah. So, you know, with all the money from the venture capitals, why don't we spend it, you know, Number one, of course, we give 50% to our teachers, and then we want to give the other 50% to our partners with great content and all the other things. So um, I, I'm so thankful that uh, one of our teachers is actually here today, um, uh, Gretchen. I would probably give her one minute, if it's po that's possible, to um, explain to us how she finds us and how we find her and why she would want to <laughs> work with a weird Chinese company when that offers tutoring online. So Gretchen, if you want to come up, we're just there. Just one to two mi one minute, we'll be... Wonderful. Thank you. I think there's a mic behind you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. And I meet with all my teachers where Hello. I go. So Hello. these are the signatures I collect from it's my not working. heroes. Is it? That's how important everyone is. So uh, yeah. Oh, we've also got uh, you know, uh, some sort of uh, marketing <laughs> materials. Um, <laughs> what kind of partnership we're looking for. If you see Hello. all these shirts on, uh, you know, come find us. Talk to us. We're ready with... Uh, Yes, dollars from our investors. <laughs> and also, most importantly, vision. I think that's what Gretchen is touching on. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm located here in San Diego, and Yay. I, um, so that's why I'm so fortunate to come to this conference. So thank you very much for having me. Um, 
I found VIP Kid um, through FlexJobs. Dot com. I was actually looking through, I was looking for a job like this for a long time, something that I could do while traveling and um, from the comfort of my own home, just, you know, get out of the classroom for a while. And I have just had a wonderful experience working for VIP Kid. I get to spend seven hours a day, well, maybe five to seven hours a day with, with you know, many wonderful children in China who I've created a relationship with. And... You know, it's great. It's great. We get to share cultures, um, laughter, um, my my knowledge of English, and um, it's just been a really wonderful opportunity. And they are the global leaders of the world, of the next generation. So I feel very fortunate to be a part of that process. So, thank you. International collaboration. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. That's great. So yeah, we have a, a live example of the cross-border collaboration, yeah. which Gretchen is really good. Gretchen told me she, she goes into homes of, of Chinese kids. She see them on video and audio. Sometimes the whole family dies right after you know the, the, the video conferencing system. <laughs> That's great. A lot of fun. Yeah. Yep. Great. Um, and I know doing your company, Homework Together, also partners with uh, companies outside of China around content and technology. And I'm specifically interested in like, why have you chosen to work sometimes with global partners as opposed to Chinese companies? Are there certain things that you feel like global partners can bring to homework together that other partners couldn't? Sure, so I'll give two examples. Uh, we, we're working with Newton on an adaptive learning solution. And um, uh, this is a technology partner. And um, I think adaptive learning is a space that uh, all the ed tech companies are very interested in. And I don't think anyone uh, who claims to be doing adaptive learning is doing adaptive learning at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, but I do think that Newton is a global leader uh, in that space. And um, when we choose uh, partners, we don't really consider whether they're Chinese or, um, or not. Um, we find the best partners to work with. And uh, Newton gave, uh, gave us lots of insight on um, how to do adaptive learning, not just from a technology perspective, but also um, from <coughs> content curation and um, uh, how to uh, explain your products to, to the customers and, um, and it's, a, it's a whole process and it's an experience that they gain uh, through working with other global partners. Um, and we also worked with uh, Kaplan um, and they made an English learning product called Piccolo um, and it's, uh, they spent millions of dollars on the product and um, we're their uh, China distributor uh, for that product. Um, and um, uh, in that sense, we actually help them localize the product because it's, um, uh, in English learning for Chinese kids is different from English learning for, say, uh, U.S. kids. Um, and um, um, we are learning a lot from each other. Um, for example, uh, when Chinese uh, teachers teach about this topic called my family, they never teach about pets. Uh, mm -hmm. Pets are not really considered part of the family. Um, but there's a unit in the Piccolo product that uh, talks specifically about the Queen's uh, Corgis, uh, the mm -hmm. British Queen's Corgis. Um, and, um, and the, this has uh, really raised a lot of uh, interest uh, from the students and from the teachers. And uh, I think um, th these types of great content are not just for English teaching, but uh, also for cross-cultural um, awareness. And, um, um, and uh, content is very cheap, actually, to distribute. We charge about $30 for half a year, which mm -hmm. is like when hundreds of VIP kids charge. Um, and, um, uh, I think internet is, is, is a very good way to democratize good uh, education resources. And uh, in that sense, actually, although currently we have very few international users, uh, we are thinking of uh, ex having some international, <coughs> we hope that we can have some international users in the future as well. Uh, but in any case, uh, we are constantly looking for uh, you know, content, and technology, product, and you know, all kinds of uh, partnerships uh, anywhere in the world. And we have 20 million students, so if you want uh, to have a, a good test base uh, for a product, especially in schools, then uh, and we're definitely a good partner for you. Yeah. Great. Um, so we're just about at time. I feel like we could spend like a whole day discussing this <laughs> rather than just an hour or a couple of days. So um, you know, looking forward to the day where uh, ASU GSV comes to China, because I think we could have a whole conference about it. Um, yep. But uh, I wanted to just quickly say that uh, there's a really great report on the China ed tech market that JMD EDU has put together that you can find on their website at www.jmdedu.com. 
Uh, I've been studying the edtech market for a while and uh, in China, and I still found that this was like a very useful report. Um, so just wanted to quickly mention that because I know a lot of people are thinking about the China market. And then I wanted to really uh, extend my sincere thank you to the panelists for sharing their insights with all of us. So thank you. Thank you.